Did the manager let you have any? Um, well, I don't think he knew about it, but oh. he might do now. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd said that she'd brought him in a cake. I thought as in like you'd wheeled in a giant cake he and Pablo sort of jumped out of it. Oh, oh, no, we need oh, to make no, this no. happen. This is the official Leeds United podcast. And this podcast was recorded at midday on the 20th of April. And at the time of recording, all of the information discussed regarding the European Super League was correct, I think. Of course, I'm now recording this disclaimer on Wednesday evening and things have changed considerably, all for the better. However, we do think that there were some really great points raised in, in this show by everyone involved. And also, we must not let them forget what they tried to do. Therefore, we are going to leave the show as is um, for posterity and we hope you enjoy. Shall we start with that Liverpool game? Um a great point, first goal for Urente, which was amazing. Was he buzzing after that, Patrick? Yeah, he's um, since he started coming into the team, or he was back fit and started playing. You saw him kind of open up a lot more, and he was he was relatively quiet when he first joined. And I think obviously it's hard coming to a new club, getting injured, and then not knowing anyone. But he's really come out of like stepped out his own skin, really, and he's playing better and better each game. And he's like, he's a good lad. He's, his English isn't what, perfect, but he tries. What's he like as a person, his personality? He's still quiet. He's kind of like an introvert, but um, he's, if it makes sense, he's come out more than he was before when he first joined, if you know what I mean. He's like, he's still quiet, but he does interact with the lads a lot more and he, he tries, like, he's learning English better and better each week, so. Oh, okay. is, is there anyone who's kind of, you know, been his sidekick or his wingman who's tried to bring out the best in him I think the, sp the Spanish lads try um, and obviously they helped him feel welcome because all he spoke was Spanish when he first joined but uh, the more he started to play the more he started talking to people like on and off the pitch and like, I, I probably didn't get a word out of maybe got two words out of him the first like month he was here two months whilst he was injured and stuff because wow. you don't really see him that much but now he opens up and you can you can chat with him and yeah, he's, he's, I think he's starting be, to feel a lot It must be so more difficult settled. because, as you said, he's come over here. His English isn't perfect. He's come into a, what is already a very close-knit squad. You've been together for a long time. He gets injured, so he's not fully in training. He's not on the pitch. And also, we've got COVID going on, so it's not like you're able to go out and do a huge amount of team bonding. Has there been anything that you guys have tried to do in light of COVID where you've you've tried to sort of initiate these guys and get them to be able to blend into the squad obviously that's very difficult with everything going on but is there some special measures you you guys have been able to do to try and ingratiate these guys uh no it's difficult because of the covid situation i mean especially with the injured players as well because yeah the injured players you pretty much you, you won't see them if you're if you're with if you're training with the team the injured players will be with the physio they'll be in the gym upstairs whereas we do all our gym work in the dome and so you, you might go a couple of weeks where you, you only just see them in passing in the corridor or whatever. So you don't spend a lot of time with the injured players. I think that we've had certain things like with Pablo, Pablo's wife sent him in a cake as a surprise. So everyone got together and sang happy birthday in the changing room without Pablo knowing and there's this big cake brought in. So little things like that to try and keep the group like all together and stuff. But it's what, difficult. Just quickly, what kind of cake was it? <laughs> it, it was big it was like was it? a massive chocolate one I think it had Ferrero Rocher's on it and it did, was massive did, did the manager let you have any? Um, well I don't think he knew about it but oh. he might do now <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd said that she'd brought him in a cake I thought as in like you'd wheeled in a giant cake he and Pablo sort of jumped out of it Oh, no, 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 no. We need oh, to make no, no. this happen. <laughs> we need to make this happen. Is. And he just pops out of the cake for for Llorente. But imagine we had we had the so did that on I think it was two two days or three days before the city game. Um, so Ma organised it or organised the cake and Stewie brought it in for Pablo. And then it was Stewie's birthday. I think it was the day of the was it either the yeah, day of the Liverpool yesterday, game? Right? Yeah, and um, at lunchtime. All of a sudden, started singing "Happy Birthday." This big sparkler comes out into the, where we're having lunch, 
<laughs> and he's got strawberries with a sparkler in it <laughs> instead of a cake. <laughs> and for you, Patrick, how are you feeling? Because obviously, um, three points against Man City, a point against Liverpool. Is there an element of you and your teammates? Do you feel quite kind of just liberated and able to play freely against these teams? Um, I don't know, because there's still that kind of... Whilst it's those, it's the games that there's not really that much pressure on because everyone expects the mm. Man City's and Liverpool's to win. I think before the game, we still put pressure on ourselves. Like against the city, against City, we felt like that we could get something out of the game, and then the fact that we won it in the way we did. I remember on the walk yesterday, me and Cal were talking and just saying, "I, f- I feel like we can do these tonight. Like I feel like if we get after them, we can win. Like we can win this." And I think that was the feeling throughout the group, and. I was I was frustrated after the game, like really frustrated that we hadn't won. Like I felt as coming off the pitch, how how have we not won that? I know the first half they probably deserved it, but second half we really like had them up against the wall, and it was just it was frustrating. It was it was a weird feeling going into that to that game, complete um, opposite of last week and and the first game of the season where it was kind of like, oh, I just hope we play well and obviously these guys are a different class to us and I just hope that we, we don't get embarrassed or whatever. But last night, I was just like, this just feels like another Premier League game. I just felt like they're completely our level and there's no reason why we can't just go and, and play and beat them today. I didn't feel any nerves before kickoff whatsoever. Um, I think that's just like just a, a testament of just how far we have come, that we are now you know toe-to-toe with... Elite Super League club, so it's good. Oh. <laughs> I was actually sick in my mouth yesterday in the on the pitch. <laughs> mate, I was no, I was blowing at one point. You that bad, mate. At one point, right? <laughs> so we, I think it was just after I hit the bar. They broke on a counter attack, and I've literally sprinted back from our eighteen yard box. No, from theirs to ours, and then nothing came of it. And Ilan got the ball and like we started attacking again so I had to run all the way back up the pitch <laughs> and then we've just kept the ball at the like the back passing it round and like I thought I was just about to burp so I just burped <laughs> and I'm not joking you <laughs> like I was just sick in my mouth I was like oh that's oh. disgusting so I had to spit it out and then the oh. rest of the game the rest of the game I just got this horrible no 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 it was on the pitch but it was only oh. like a little bit but oh. then I've got the rest of the game I've just got this taste of sick in my mouth oh. it's horrible oh, <laughs> No, because I was trying to stay away because Marcelo, after I'd just done that run, I heard him shouting, Patrick, move. And I was thinking, oh my oh, God, I'm God. dying. <laughs> Listening on together. Let's talk about the big stinking elephant in the room uh, for the last 20 minutes, shall we? Because um, the last few days, as we all know, have been dominated by a discussion about the proposed breakaway European Super League. Now, Pat, I'll start with you because I know obviously you were asked about it yeah. in your post-game chat. Um, you've spoken about your opposition to it. Can you elaborate on that anymore? Um, I think the, the awkward thing for us as players and probably everyone is that we've only heard what's been released to the to the public. Like I only know about it from Twitter and from Sky Sports News. So like, I can't profess to know all the ins and outs of the details and stuff. But from what I have seen, it just it doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't seem fair on the rest of football. It seems very like elitist. And I actually saw, I think I can't remember exactly word for word what Marcelo said. But how about in in all walks of life, like the rich make money to get richer and the poor just get poorer. So why wouldn't it happen in football? Because it happens everywhere else. And it's sad. That it's true. That's actually true. And it's sad that it's true. But I think that with the fans and with the way that if we all come together and kind of stand our ground, we can possibly stop it happening. Um, My thoughts pretty much align with what Patrick said there. Um, It's just for the rich clubs to get richer. Um, When you're talking about the possibility of not having any relegations or promotions, it doesn't matter how well or badly they do in in their domestic leagues. Um, They will still be a major part of this um, elitist league, you know, to, to rival the Champions League. But my frustration with it is the whole point of the Champions League, whether it's run correctly or badly, 
with, in terms of the financial aspects of it. You, you've seen teams like Leicester City come out of nowhere and win the Premier League. And in the following season, they're in the Champions League through merit you know they've worked really hard for it and they're a breath for fresh air a different team to play against all these um, amazing teams from around the world now they're there because of merit as I've mentioned before if they still win the Premier League they're not welcome in this elitist league you know the the ESL they're, they're nicknaming it which in my opinion is, is it's not right it's not fair and the problem is is what we talked about earlier is that Football is becoming business and and unpredictability is anathema to business. And they're trying to remove any level of unpredictability from sport. But that is, by definition, what makes sport so brilliant. That's why we play. Anything can happen. And they're trying to remove that like they've removed it from music. Every pop song sounds the same as every other pop song. Every film's a remake. It's a, it's a, it's a formulaic blockbuster. They're trying to take it out of sport now. And and I just think that once that's gone, we're gonna have nothing left. And 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 I it frustrates me. You know my <laughs> my uh, I'm gonna stop in a minute um, because I know I'm boring everyone. But like my, you know my therapist tells me right that that injustice is one of my triggers. That that w- injustice makes me mad and leads to anger. And and all I see in this is pure injustice. That, that for so many people, particularly this year, you know, working class people, sport has been their only outlet and has been for a long, long time. Not just this year, especially this year, but for a long, long time. They've, they've been squeezed out of everything, you know, without wanting to go too much into politics and stuff. But the gross inequality across across the world and, and it's getting worse. And so many people had a refuge in, in sport and in particularly in football because it's egalitarian. Everyone can do it. You can go get a tin can out of the bin and you can play football. You see it in, 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 in South America and, and Africa. And it's, it, and it's got so many people through so much. And these guys who are so greedy and have taken so much and squeezed so much out of the football fans that have made them and put them where they are. And now they're coming for football as well. And even the maddest Roman emperors knew better than to mess with the Colosseum. Like, you just cannot keep squeezing people until they've got nothing left but football and then come for that as well. And and I just, I, I find it a grave, grave injustice. And I hope that, that, that these guys wake up and appreciate that once it's gone, they're never getting it back and they need to listen to these people who put them there, i.e. the fans. And you can, guys can all talk about it now. Yeah. All of us players, before we became professional, before we even got in onto the football kind of pyramid, we were all fans. Like, without a doubt, all of us supported somebody, went to watch somebody, had idols who were football fans of people. And so we're going to see it the same way as every other person does who supports their football team. I don't think you'll. I don't think you'll come across. You might come across the odd few footballers who purely play for the money and think, oh, it's a chance for me to make even more money. But I'd, I'm pretty sure that the majority of footballers will think that this is wrong. You said after the match that you wished that football was as quick to react to other matters such as racism. Can you yeah. just um, elaborate on that for us? Yeah, it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of like a spur of the moment thing because this question got sprung on me. But um, I just felt like, now everyone's kind of kicked up. I understand why everyone's kicked up such a fuss when something like this has been just thrown our way, like out of the blue. But you saw all of a sudden how quick everyone from UEFA, FIFA, <laughs> everybody in those kind of circles reacted. Like it was straight away, we're going to do this. Not gonna, it's not going to be allowed. The Premier League, Boris Johnson got involved straight away, the Prime Minister. Like, this can't happen. We're going to do everything we can to stop it. When it came to, like, racism and things like that, you're seeing, like, measly, like, £10,000 fines and a free game ban or something stupid. And it's, like, kind of swept under the carpet. But, like, racism isn't hurting people's pockets. It's And it, if anything, it's more serious because it's on a human level. And the fact that this is actually something that's, taking money away from people, people are then starting to care and all of a sudden everyone's got their arms up in rage. And I just think that 
maybe if we put the same amount of energy into not just racism but things along that kind of line then that those problems would be eradicated quicker i think you'd be hard pushed to find anyone that disagrees with you patrick um, now, on a brighter note, lads, we've got to send a huge congratulations <laughs> to the Leeds United under-23s and their manager, Mark Jackson, who've just yeah. sealed the Premier League 2 title and promotion yeah. to Premier League 2 Another Division 1. one. <laughs> <laughs> Unstoppable, okay, this horse. I'm sick of winning trophies. I'm sick of it. It's boring now. <laughs> it's an incredible Amazing. achievement and it, it's going to see the under-23s going up against the top academy sides next season. Uh, Pat, am I right in thinking that the senior squad gave the under-21s a guard of honour? Yeah, we did after one of the videos. All of Love us in that. a line into the dome and just let them all walk through and gave them a clap. So. Yeah. Did anyone give you any the lads... stick? Were you getting any little, any little cheeky look from any of the youngsters? Nah, to be fair, I think they felt a little bit awkward, like kind of walking through. But the, I, the main reason we did it, obviously, a great achievement for them winning the league and stuff. But being one of them under 23 players is possibly they have a harder job week to week than any of us boys because they literally sometimes they'll come in to make numbers. They'll leave their training session to come in just to give passes in a certain drill that we need players for. And they'll be like there for five minutes, then running back over to their squad. Then 10 minutes later, they've got to run back over. So mm. the amount they actually sacrificed to help the first team, I think that that was probably the main reason why we made such like an effort and kind of gave them even more plaudits because they give a lot up, a lot up for us and um, just wanted to let them know that we, we appreciate it. Was, did, um, did, um, did Joe or anyone, like, when they're walking past, say to you, hey, I'm coming for your spot, mate, you better keep, keep yourself on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he, <laughs> he's more of a 10 anyway, so it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of 10s, mate. <laughs> uh, nah, they, there's a good group there, though. There's some good players, yeah. so... Did um, yeah, did any of the injured players good. try and try and sneak in the guard of honour? Was like Rodrigo and Forshaw there? Like, yeah, thanks guys, <laughs> thanks for that. Do you know what? Costa nearly Costa tried to grab it as they all walked through. He tried to just <laughs> he was doing the clapping and then he tried to join on the back of the queue. So I deserve a medal. <laughs> this is the official Leeds United podcast. <laughs>